Amen. Lord, we come before you humbly this morning, and we're here to worship you in this place, God. We are the people of your valley, Lord, and we're here to give you praise and praise your name in this place, for you are truly, truly worthy of it all, God. We're here humbled by the majesty of your greatness, Lord, for you have done great and excellent things, Lord, and you are worthy of it all, God. So this morning, we pray that you would come and be a part of this service, Lord, that as we sing your praises, as we sing your worship, Lord, that you would accept it as an offering of our praise and of our heart, Lord. We bow our hearts before you this morning. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Stand and join us as we praise in this place. Hallelujah. 
to our God and our King. For you have done great things, God. We'll tell the whole world of your goodness and your mercy, God. We worship you in this place, and we put you back on the throne of our hearts, Lord. Amen. i got a new song for you all this morning, and it's all about that, just declaring that God has done great things, proclaiming his deeds among the nations. And it goes like this. And come let us worship our King. And come let us bow at his feet. And he has done great things. See what our Savior has done. And see what our Savior has done. And see how his love overcomes. And he has done great things. And he has done great things. Yeah, oh hero. Oh hero of heaven. You conquer the grave, you free every captain and break every chain, oh God. And you have done great things. We dance, we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. And you have done great things. Yes, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. Yes, you have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things And God, you do great things Yeah, oh hero Oh hero of heaven You conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God, you have done great things We dance, we dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh, God, you have done. Let's sing it again, oh, hero. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive, you break every chain, oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things, yes, you have done great things, hallelujah, and hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, yes. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive. Break every chain, oh God, and you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God, you have done great things You have done great things Oh God, you have done great things You've done great things. Amen. Yes, God.
Yes, God, we will declare your deeds among all the nations, Lord, for you are the great God, and you are worthy of it all. All praise, all honor, all glory. Who is like you, our King? Hallelujah. By the strength of your mighty hand, you uphold us with the salvation that was won through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Lord Jesus, we give you honor and praise and glory in this place. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, forever and ever. Amen.
All that God has done in your life and my life for the nations, what He's yet to do. Because He truly is our hope, the author, the perfecter of our salvation, who was, who is, and is to come. Let's just tell Him. You're my author, my maker, my ransom, my savior, my refuge, my hiding place. Yes, He is. You're my helper, my healer, my blessed redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. He's our hope. You're my hope in the shadows, my strength in the battle, my anchor for all my days. And as you stand by my side, and you stood in my place, Jesus, no other name. Jesus, no other name. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy of Your name. You are worthy. You are worthy of Your name. You are worthy. You are worthy. bow down before you, our King, this morning, God. Lord, all we desire is you, your love, your presence, your face. Oh, how lovely is your name, Lord. How lovely is your dwelling place, oh God Almighty. We give you praise, Lord. We give you honor, glory, majesty. Take it all, God. Leave us here with you, our King, our God, my Father. In the secret place, and where I see your face, will you take me there again? And you can search my heart. In the deepest part, from beginning to the end, to you, to you, my eyes are lifting. To you, my prayer is rising up. You've captured my attention. Consume me, consume me, God, give me a heart of and ever after you alone. Gold and silver, you can't take it all.
As we prepare this morning for tithes and offerings, I would be remiss if I didn't, you know, share the different ways you can give because I always forget to do that, so I made a note not to forget to do that. Um, We've got all the information over here. You can also go to our website online, in person, cash, check, crypto. We got the scanner there. Um, For more information, just head to our website. And I know I said it, but last week, and Dad says it all the time, we're not here to, you know, try to get your money. We're not after your money. We're after what can be credited to your account with God. And I touched that last week, you know, with what an offering is and how it can be credited to your your, um, account with God for righteousness. And I want to continue that thought this morning. If you guys would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I got the clicker this time. I got the clicker this time. So I actually know where I'm going. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to look at verses uh, 6 to 15. And I just want to encourage you guys with Paul's words here. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, pardon me, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expression of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their hearts, sorry, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And that's it, my friends. When you sow, you are sowing into the kingdom. I know Paul was speaking to the church at Corinth, but if you can hear it, he's also speaking to you. When you guys sow into the house and you sow into the kingdom, your seed creates bread for the eater. And we see this with the uh, the food banks that we are part of in Israel and the orphanages that we're part of in Nepal and in India. When you are sowing, you are sowing into the kingdom. And so God will bless you generously because of that, and he'll provide you more seed to sow so that you can be a blessing on every occasion. And you see, right now, it's through your seed that God is passing out bread, if you will, if you'll borrow the allegory with me, through Pastor Rod. He's passing out the bread of your seed that you've been sowing. He's going out into the field and spreading the gospel, and it's only because you guys are sowing, right? That's, that's why when we say we're not here after your money, we're after what can be credited to your account. You guys are a part of what dad is doing over in South Africa. You guys are a part of what this church is doing in Nepal. You are a part of what this church is doing in India. Do you guys hear that? You're sowing into the kingdom with that. So I encourage you guys, don't give out of an ob- obligation and, and don't give out of that desire to get back, but give out of the fact that God is moving in your heart. Right? Because God will then also increase the store of your seed and enlarge your harvest of righteousness. I want to re- read that verse again. It's verse 10. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So give out a desire to bless God, and to spread his hand and his kingdom the world over. Amen? Amen. Well, Lord, I bless these tithes and these offerings now in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would... Multiply them, some 30, some 60, and some even 100-fold, God. I pray that you continue to provide sowing, a seed to the sower and bread to the eater, God, that your word might be spread, that your hand might be moved on this earth, God. I pray that you would come and be a part of these seeds that we're planting into the ground. I pray that you would water the ground and prepare it for a good harvest, God. I pray that you bless your children now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Get some water real quick. <clears throat> what happens when you sing and then you got to talk. So I mentioned it earlier. I am blessed to be here with you all today. As dad continues his time 
out in the field. I'm happy to be here at home with you guys. And as you may recall, last week I mentioned that I fancy myself more of a teacher than a preacher. Um, I really enjoy kind of unpacking the word, right? Uh, in the old days, what they would do is they would open the scriptures and they would examine them. And that's kind of my, I get, I get a kick out of doing that. I really enjoy doing that. And so I, you know, I want to continue where we left off uh, with praise and worship was what we kind of talked about last week. Um, and as we examine the scriptures, we really get kind of a peek into the mind of our God because his word is alive and has so much for us, not just, you know, here on church on Sunday mornings, but day to day, week to week, month to month. And so last week I mentioned, you know, I only preached half of my message, um, I actually took some advice from dad on this. He's like, well, can you preach this Sunday, this Sunday? I'm like, absolutely. And he said, honestly, son, don't worry about preparing two messages. Prepare one, cut it in half, and you'd probably be good. So I took his advice because uh, if you guys have sat with me before, I have a tendency to try and pack in a ton in a very short uh, time period. So last week I said, tune in next time. And this time we're diving into part two. So uh, last week, you guys might remember, but I will review it a little bit here. Uh, we really dove into the topic of praise and worship. Um, we dove into biblical examples of praise and worship, right? The Israelites' nation being birthed uh, after they crossed the Red Sea. They opened it with praise and worship. And uh, we talked about David and Israel, you know, dancing, singing, and praising with all their might as they brought the ark back into Jerusalem. Um, like every six steps, they were sacrificing. It's like a, a new party every six steps. Uh, we also looked at when Solomon dedicated the new temple that he built, and the glory of the Lord was so heavy after their time of worship that the priests couldn't even enter the temple um, to perform their duties, or Paul and Silas praising God in the midnight hour. And then even in Hebrews, we talked about Jesus singing and praising God in the assembly of the believers. And we really talked about the importance of this time of praise and worship and how it's meant to be more than just you know some nice songs at the beginning of service, but really how it's more of an integral part of our Christian walk. And, you know, we talked a, a little bit about how praise and worship are a powerful thing too, right? We, we learned about David and the evil spirit that was tormenting Saul, and we kind of looked at all that. And so I want to continue that thought process today because as a worship leader since 2011, I've seen and heard a ton of thoughts about praise and worship, um, things I've been guilty of, things other people might have been guilty of, but nonetheless, these are some common themes that I've come across in my time uh, as a worship leader, and I've got them up here for you guys, that, you know, the time of praise and worship in the church service can be kind of boring. Well, that's true, right? Sometimes we play the same songs over and over again because praise and worship in service is kind of routine, right? We just sing songs, and sometimes it's the same song again and again, and then we kind of go from there into announcements and ties, right? I'd rather just come to church for the preaching and the fellowship. Uh, other things I've heard, you know, praise and worship can be annoying because there's always that one person who sings out of key and they sing rather loudly. Um, sometimes that's me up on stage, so I apologize. <laughs> uh, or it's, you know, just the beginning part of the service. It's really not that necessary because I can get close to God without the time of songs. I've also heard, you know, praise and worship is a great tool to get what I want or need, healing, peace, strength. And, you know, praise and worship are things that I do at church. I might listen to Kayla from time to time, but I really get my praise on at church. I've come across all of these things in my time, and, I'm, and I mean no rebukes whatsoever sharing this list. I'm guilty myself of some of these things um, at various times in my life, but I'm also here to tell you guys that there are you know, some flaws in each of these things because there's so much more to praise and worship than these points. And, and you might recall that I left off with a, a cliffhanger last week. Yes, intentional. Got to have a little fun. Right, I said uh, that I had been misspeaking, and I did so so much in these bullet points as well. I had been misspeaking because I had been lumping the terms praise and worship together into one kind of thing. And that's what we in church do all the time. We just praise and worship, praise and worship, praise and worship. We're always lumping them together. And while that's something that we do, and they are intertwined with each other, they're actually very different at their core. And so hopefully I didn't cause any problems with the list. I wasn't intending to if I did. I just want to continue our quest to study the Bible and kind of separate what is praise, what is worship, um, as we kind of dive in. So if you guys would turn with me to Psalm, well, I've, I, I've actually, I got a note. I've got it on the screen, Psalm 100. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, 
Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And this was one of the main verses I left you with last week and I want to pick up right there again. Um, Would you guys pray with me real quick? Lord, I come before you humbly this morning, and we thank you for coming and being a part of this service. God, we invite you into this house this morning, and I pray that I would not go beyond your word, but my mouth would be a gospel horn, Lord. Just like David wrote, open my mouth and your praise will flow forth from my lips, God, and that's that's my goal. I pray that you be glorified and you be satisfied, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me read that verse again. Because you'll see that the words praise and worship are actually not thrown together in one fell swoop. Shout for joy all the Lord. Sorry, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. That's the only sentence that you see worship in. And then later on, right, it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So there's there's two different context and two different trains of thought around the word praise and around the word worship, right? Worship the Lord with gladness versus enter his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. And often in church, we bundle these things together, but they are in fact uh, very different from each other. And we'll, we see that play out in this verse here too. You see, I can give you praise for a job well done, but that is very different than worshiping someone or something, right? You get an A on your math test and the teacher gives you praise for it, right? Good job, right? That's giving you praise for a job well done. But the teacher certainly isn't worshiping you for it. So I want to dive in and see what the Bible has to teach us on biblical praise of God and worship. And did you guys know that if you look through the NIV, you'll actually find the word praise, just in the NIV, you'll find the word praise 299 times. Worship, you'll find 156 times. Totally different numbers, totally different contexts. But if you look specifically in Hebrew, you'll see a Hebrew word for praise 170 times, and for worship, you'll find 168 times. And the reason why is English um, kind of loses its, its oomph, right? It kind of lumps things together. Like we have one word for love. Greek has like five, right? And so the Bible very clearly delineates the terms praise and worship. And I want to make it clear that you can praise while worshiping, and you can worship while praising, but the two are very different from each other. Let me say it again. You can praise while worshiping, and you can worship while praising, biblically speaking, but the two are very different from each other. And so I want to dive deep into this, and I hope to share just kind of a glimpse of the magnitude of both. And first, I want to talk about praise. And so with praise, I want to ask you just a couple of quick questions. You don't need to answer them, but uh, just consider for a moment. Um, what is praise, when do I praise, who do I praise, why do I praise, and how do I praise? When we're trying to understand these things, right? What is it, when do I do it, how do I do it, why do I do it, and who do I do it to? And so to first answer that question, what is praise? Again, unfortunately, English kind of bundles a lot of things together, but if you look at Cambridge Dictionary, when it's used as a verb, Praise is expressing admiration or approval of the achievements of a, or characteristics of a person or thing. So we're praising something that has been done. We're praising the characteristics of the person, right? Who that person is or what they've done. Or in a noun, things that you say that express your admiration or approval for something. So when we ask the question, what is praise? That can also be partially answered by when do I praise, right? I might praise lawmakers when they pass a bipartisan bill to reduce taxes. Yes, lower taxes are good. Um, I might praise little Timmy when he makes an amazing play on the basketball court, or when your boss gives you praise for a job well done, you might feel a little more pep in your step, right? See, praise on the surface is more of an outpouring, if you will. It's an outward expression of your thoughts, right? Expressing admiration or approval of achievements or characteristics. And so when it comes to that idea of when do I praise, right, you can praise in any number of situations. And so it's also important to look at who do you praise, because sometimes you can incorrectly praise as well, right? You give your 
coworker Clint praised for cleaning up the mess on aisle 11, but it was really Natasha that cleaned it up, right? And unless Clint corrects you, you'd never know it was Natasha cleaning up the mess. And so you would have incorrectly attributed praise to Clint as opposed to Natasha. So it's important to give this praise, this outward expression of thanks or gratitude or admiration when praise is due, but it's also equally, equally important to praise correctly as well because we don't want to misappropriate praise. Is this make, making sense so far? So if you're talking about praising God, biblically speaking, we're talking about praising God, just a cursory reading of the Bible will actually give you a myriad of reasons to praise him correctly. And I don't have time to go through every single one of them because we'd be reading the whole Bible today. But I do want to look real quick, if you guys would turn with me to Psalm 136, and we'll see in this Psalm, Psalm 136, we'll essentially see the entire picture of who to praise, why to praise, and when to praise. And so let me get over here to Psalm 136. And it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks, or in this case, praise to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Praise the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him alone, who does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. And it goes on and on. I'm not going to read it all, but you get the idea. We, we see in this passage who to praise God, why to praise, and we see when to praise, right? First, we're seeing to praise him for the workers of his hand. Right, And then we're seeing to praise him for his character. I'm going to read just one again. He made the great lights. That's something that he did. And then it answers that his love endures forever. So we've praised what he's done, and we've praised his character of love. Right? He does great wonders. He created the heavens, the earth, the waters, the lights, and the sky. He brought Israel out of Egypt. He remembered us in our low state. He freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature. And it also lists why and we praise him for who he is. And it goes through his attributes in this psalm as well. It lists him as the God of heaven, the Lord of lords, the God of gods, the one who's always loving and always kind. He's a valiant leader and so on. And it's, it's, it's so deep, we're only scratching the surface here, and I, and I want to read um, at the beginning, it kind of answers, you know, when to praise, why to praise, um, because it's important to understand that. And I want to read one more for you, just a few chapters down the road, our buddy from last week, David, we spent a lot of time talking about David, uh, he continues in Psalm 145, so just flip a couple of pages over, Psalm 145, verses 1 to 3. It says, a psalm of praise of David, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. And honestly, I would encourage you to read all of Psalm 145 if you're looking for more reasons to add to your list of why to praise God. Because it's just so good. So many of his attributes are listed in this passage. In Psalm 136 as well, so many works of his hand and so many attributes of his character. And David also answers the question, when to praise, in verses 1 to 2. And at the end of this psalm, all the way down at verse 21, I put him on the screen here for you guys. So he opens the psalm with, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. And then he closes the psalm with basically mirroring it. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. You see, the Bible is very clear that we are to praise God, right? That's who we are to praise. We're to praise him for what he's done. And we're also to praise him for who he is. And we're also answered here in these two short passages, when to praise every day. And we're also given why to praise because God is good and his love and mercy endure forever. But what about how to praise? It's not so much answered in these two passages, but the Bible is actually very specific in giving us direction in how to praise God. Very specific, and it gives us very clear examples. And so I want to dive in then and look at how we are directed to praise God in an appropriate and an acceptable manner. 
And the first one I want to look at is probably the easiest, and this is the Hebrew word zamar. I might be pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, I am not a Hebrew scholar by any means, so if I am butchering it, I apologize. But this is actually what we do each and every Sunday morning together as the body. Zamar essentially means to make music in praise of God. And that's what we do here on Sunday mornings. It's, it's adding an extra emphasis contextually on praising with singing and with music, you know, with stringed instruments, with the harp, with the lyre, with the cymbal. It's making music to praise God. And that's part of why we do it as the body. It's, it's a directed, biblically directed, appropriate way to praise God through music. And I'll, I'll give you guys an example of God using instruments or directing us to praise with instruments and music. And that's Psalm 150. You don't have to turn there. I've got it on the screen. It's because I got a lot of verses I want to share with you. Uh, Psalm 150, verses 3 to 5, uh, it says, Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and with dancing. Praise him with the strings and the pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. And the idea of making music to the Lord is also mirrored in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Uh, Paul is exhorting the church in Ephesus on how Christians are to live. And he says here, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. So it is a biblically appropriate and acceptable way to praise God through song and with, through music. And that's exactly what we do here every Sunday morning. And so when we, when we play music on Sunday mornings, it goes so much deeper than just doing songs. You see, when it's done unto the Lord, it's a biblically accurate and a proved method of praising God. And you guys might notice sometimes on Sunday mornings, we'll just back off of singing and we just kind of make music. What we're actually doing there is we are praising God through instruments. We're praising God through instruments. So when you make music unto the Lord, you're glorifying him. We're not doing it really to show off our skills. We're doing it to glorify God. Right, an example like this morning, right? There was some free time of worship where we just kind of sat and saturated in his presence. If you notice, I kept playing. I wasn't doing that because, oh, this sounds good. I was doing that because I want to zamar. I want to make music in praise of God. And every single one of us has our own instruments pre-built in. We've got hands, we've got voices, right? We can hum, we can sing, we can dance, right? It's making music to praise God. And that is Zamar. The next biblical example we see is Toda. And again, I could be uh, pronouncing it wrong, but Toda is essentially thanksgiving. And it's usually in the context of a sacrifice, So we sacrifice, in this case, our mind, our will, and emotions, and praise God despite what is going on, right? I might be in the middle of a trial, I might be in the middle of a tribulation, and yet I will still toda, I will sacrifice my mind, will, and emotions in thanksgiving to God. And it's actually why David, throughout the Psalms, often speaks to his own body. He directs his tongue to praise God. He tells his soul to praise God. He directs his mind and body to praise God. And and Job actually gave us an amazing example for this. Um, In Job, it's spoken of him. Um, I I didn't put it up there. I'm sorry. Uh, But Job, it actually says that though he slay me, yet I will praise him. And it's this idea of sacrificing, no matter what's going on with me, I will still praise. And I already gave you guys the next verse. Romans 12.1 tells us that we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And that's the idea of todah, is offering yourself as that living, living sacrifice. The next way we can praise God, biblically speaking, is with yada, which is the root word for todah. Again, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I'm hoping to share this with you guys. Yada is essentially to throw or to cast, in this case, the lifting or the raising of one's hands. If you guys ever been in church, people raise their hands. When you raise your hands in church, that's yada. That's all it is. It's the lifting and the raising of your hands. It's, it's a declaration, if you will, of utter dependence on God. It's proclaiming your love for him in that physical motion. God... You're higher than I am. I'm lifting you up above me. It's that physical motion, and it expands on that idea of sacrifice, right? I lower myself, and I raise God up. 
So it expands that idea of, of sacrificing yourself and raising God up. And we see a very powerful example of Yadah in Exodus 17. Um, the Amalekites had come and attacked Israel, and it was this great onslaught. And as long, in verse 11 of Exodus 17, as long as Moses held up his hands, and they literally used the word Yadah, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. And that's just one example that I wanted to share with you guys of Yadah. It's, it's that raising of the hands unto God. And we see this idea of lifting our hands in 1 Timothy 2.8 as well. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing. And so when people raise their hands in church, it's not just, ooh, I'm having fun. It's literally lifting and praising and lifting him up. And we all know there's a bunch of different hand raisers in church. I'm sure you guys have seen all of these. Some people have these down to a science. You got the elbow flap. I, my personal favorite is carry the TV, right? Carry the TV or the, the goalposts with a little heartburn. Ooh, man, I'm praising and I got the little heartburn, right? There's, there's all these different ways that we see, or you got the touchdown, right? This the straight up. Everybody does it in their own way. And, and I share this as kind of, it, it, it's fun. It's fun. It's okay to laugh a little bit, but it's the same concept if you die. It's, it's, it's that raising of the hands, right? The dueling light bulbs, right? We're, we're raising our hands to God. And so those are my personal favorites, you know, the carrying the TV. And if it's a big screen, you got to go a little bit wider, right? But anyways, well, the, that's, that's you die. It's, it's raising of your hands. Now, you don't have to raise your hands. But raising your hands and praising God is a biblically accurate, it is a biblically directed, it is an appropriate way to praise God with your body, is by raising your hands. So I want to keep moving, because tied in with Yadah, the raising of your hands, is Barak, or Baruch, which is the idea of bowing down, kneeling, or blessing. Right. So just like Yadah is raising your hands to praise God, Barak is bowing down or kneeling before him. It's, it's the idea that when you bow down, you're actually giving reverence to God. And it's something that's lost in America because, you know, we hate the idea of having a tyrant king. And so we threw a bunch of tea in the harbor, right? And, and in the old days when the king came in, everybody would kneel before the king, right? And it's the same concept of kneeling. It's that's giving reverence to and blessing their steps, right? We're recognizing God's holiness and his sovereignty, that he reigns over us. And so we're bowing down. And it, this can be done both physically and it can also be done spiritually, right? God, I surrender my heart to you. My heart bows down to you, my king. So it can be a physical bowing or it can be a spiritual bowing. And we see in Psalm 95, verse 6, Come, let us bow down, Barak, in worship. Let us kneel, Barak, before the Lord, our maker. It's that concept of bowing down. And the next one is one of my favorites. It's Shabak. And Shabak is essentially a shout. It's okay to shout praise to God. In fact, the Israelites shouted when they were tearing down Jericho's walls but they weren't the ones tearing it down. It was God doing so through the shout of their praise. And it's, it's continuing that idea of lifting God up because I'm giving it all out. See, when you shout, it's not just a pitiful, woo, woo. That's not a shout. To really, truly shout, you have to get down inside and push it all out, right? And so Shabbat, the idea of shouting, is the idea of getting all that's inside and pushing it out with everything you got. All right, imagine you go to the Super Bowl and everybody's in the stands. They got their foam fingers and their painted face and they're going, woo, touchdown, woo, touchdown. No, they don't do that, right? They scream, they shout, right? It's that idea of that, that guttural woo and you're just pushing it all out. And so the idea of Shabbat is, you know, not something we see in American churches either. Nobody's really shouting in church. But if you're shouting that praise to the Lord, like shouting, for example, hallelujah, or, or shouting something that's giving God glory, it is a biblically appropriate and accurate way to praise God. And I want to uh, read you guys 
uh, blessing everything with God. But reading Isaiah 12, verse 6, directs us, Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. And it's that same concept when your favorite team scores a massive touchdown or the Rapids score four goals in one night. You want to let out a woo! right? It's that, that big, that push, that shouting for joy, shouting aloud and singing for joy. So it's, again, pushing everything you got. And it's that same concept of sacrificing yourself because it can be kind of embarrassing to just shout because then everybody looks at you. What, what is Chris doing over there? Why is he yelling in church, right? So we're, we're surrendering ourselves and we're expressing our praise and giving God glory. And another way to praise after Shabbat is halal. And halal is actually the root word for hallelujah. And we actually saying hallelujah this morning. Hallelujah loosely translates to praise God. But halal, with the root word for that, literally means to be boastful, to rave, and to celebrate. And this one specific word, halal, is actually used 165 times in the Bible, and it typically gives, Hebrew, typically gives the connotation of praising God through physical motion. Physical motion. And we actually looked at this boastful, this raving version of praising God with David's example of dancing with all his might as they were bringing the ark back into Jerusalem, right? He was dancing with all of his might before the Lord, right? It's the idea of moving, clapping, dancing, giving everything you got through physical motion. It's clapping your hands. It's raving about the Lord. You think about it when you're super excited, your body just gets and gets moving, right? It's that same concept. And so we actually had a great example of Hala a few weeks ago when Deanna did her dance to the Lord. Dancing to the Lord is a biblically correct and accurate way to praise God through the physical motion, the physical movement of your body. And it's not about drawing attention to yourself. You might remember in the example of David, his wife got rather upset with him because he was dancing about and frolicking about. And his wife said, look, what are you doing out there? Put on some clothes at least, right? And he said, I wasn't dancing unto myself. I was dancing to glorify God. And what I was doing was glorifying God with all of my might. I didn't care if people were laughing at me. I didn't care what people thought of me. My only care was raving and boasting about my God and my King. Amen? It's weird, right? Shouting in church, dancing in church, and yet... As long as it's truly done unto the Lord, truly done, it truly gives him glory. It truly gives him glory. And the last one I want to look at is Tehillah. And this one's kind of a hard one to pin down in just kind of one word because it just means praise. And it's kind of a combination of the others. It's singing, it's dancing, it's bowing, it's raising your hands, it's clapping, it's shouting, it's making music, spontaneously praising the Lord. It's using many ways. It's it's like a combination of everything. And we kind of do that on, on Sunday mornings too, right? We, um, we, we dance, we clap, we sing. Tehillah, we're praising, we're praising, we're praising. Tehillah. And it's all about praising God because biblical praise is an outpouring of our celebration of God. We're getting it out, and we're praising who he is and what he's done, right? We're praising his characteristics, and we're praising the work of his hands, right? It's that making music, singing, being a living sacrifice, raising our hands, shouting, dancing. It's noisy. It's praising God. Amen? And see, all of these things are like that outpouring of our love and adoration, our admiration, our exaltation of our God, and using our body to praise the Lord. But remember how I said there's an important distinction between this concept of praise and this concept of worship, right? So we've, we've learned all these different ways we can pour out our praise to God. But I want to consider this verse with you. If you would turn with me to Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29. And if you're not fired up to get dancing, I don't know. I gotta, I gotta work on this. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 29, and I'm gonna look at verse 13. 
and it says this, the Lord says, so this is God speaking, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based merely on human rules that they have been taught. So just a minute ago, I said, when it's truly done unto the Lord, it gives him glory. But when it's not truly done unto the Lord, God recognizes that. He recognizes that these people he's speaking about were coming near to him with their mouth and their lips. They were doing lip service, but they could have been using these biblical ways to praise God, but God knows the heart of man. We know in 1 Samuel 16, when God picks David, you know, the smallest, the youngest, God looks at the heart of man. He doesn't look at the outward characteristics. He doesn't look at the outward appearance. So you could be dancing, you could be shouting, you could be praising, but unless you're actually putting your heart into it, is it really worshiping God? And that's the biggest distinction because God is looking at the heart. You see, praise can be done completely externally. Completely externally. It's just like the teacher that gives you, you know, praise for an A on your math test. There's nothing internally about it. I could, you know... I could be a bad teacher and not even care about you as a person. Yep, you got an A, good job, move on. Right, that's completely external. But when I praise God with my mouth and my lips, if my heart's not in it, there's no depth to it. You see, truly worshiping God, right? Truly worshiping God goes so much deeper than just praising him or telling him how good he is. And while that's a good thing to do, it's not worshiping him just yet. It's just praising him. See, praise is an outward reaction. Worship, true worship, is more of an inward posturing, right? I can give mental assent to praise. I can understand that God is good, but until I engage my spirit, my spirit man with it, and I truly posture my heart in this place of submission, then it's just not really deep and true worship, right? Jesus told us to worship in spirit and in truth. So a lot of the times you read the word worship in the Bible, because I don't want to give you my definition of worship. I'd rather give you the Bible's definition of worship. A lot of times you read the word worship in English. It's actually been translated from a word for fear or a word for service. Now, I don't have time to go into the concept of the fear of the Lord, but it's a concept I know you're familiar with, right? We're we're supposed to fear God right? And we're supposed to serve God. And in fact, Isaiah 29, 13, where we just read the the word worship there, it said their worship of me is based merely on human rules that they have been taught. That word there is yare. That word that we've translated from yare to English worship literally means fear, right? The fear of the Lord. Most contexts where you see this word yare or worship is defining it as the fear of the Lord, right? And it says the fear of the Lord makes one rich. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. And Job, again, I shared earlier, was described as a man who worshiped the Lord. I put it here, right? It said that he was a man who worshiped yare, God, and shunned evil. And so the first concept of worship is recognizing this fear of the Lord, that he is He is truly God, and I am truly man. And that verse that I shared in the beginning, Psalm 100, where it said, Shout for joy all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness. That word for worship was abad. That was the root word for worship. And that literally means to work or to serve. And so in English, worship kind of loses its meaning until you dig deeper into it, because worship is that idea of the inward posturing. It's a special thing between you and God. It's the bowing down of your spirit, recognizing that God is higher than you. His ways are higher. His words are true. God is sovereign. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is all present. And from the inside out, we recognize that through Yare and Abad, right? I fear the Lord and I serve him. I fear the Lord and I serve him. And it's what I meant when I said you can praise when you worship and you can worship when you praise because when you engage your spirit in that posturing of bowing down, right, that truly servicing the Lord, when you engage your spirit in that posture, you're truly, truly revering the Lord. That's where it's at. 
That's where it's at. It's the idea of putting God first above all else and surrendering yourself completely and wholly to his spirit, to his goodness, to his mercy, to his love, to his compassion. And like I said, it's, it's a very spiritual, special thing between you and God. And so special, it's actually summed up in the very first two of the Ten Commandments. Very first two of the Ten Commandments. Let's look there real quick. It's Exodus chapter 20, uh, verses 3 to 6. Second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 to 6. It says, you shall have no other gods before me, Some translations might say beside me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. That word for worship in this passage is abad. You shall not bow down before any other God. We shall not have anybody else above God. And that's the true idea of worship. It's the inward bowing down of yourself. It's the inward bowing down of your spirit, man. That's why Paul said to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, which is your true and spiritual worship. It's the idea of putting myself down and lifting God up. I am bowing down. I am serving him and I reverence him. I fear him. He is holy. He is the God. And it's the idea of truly the sacrifice of oneself on the altar of God's goodness. And so I'll close out with this idea that praise is the outward proclamation. Worship is the inward posturing. Praise is the outward proclamation. Worship is the inward uh, posturing. You see, worship is just as much what you do here on Sunday mornings as what you do Tuesday night at 8.30, right? If we're serving our king, we are worshiping our king. I'm going to do it more than just Sunday morning. I need to do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? Paul said to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And Jesus taught us in Matthew 6 that no man can serve, worship, two masters, right? You'll either serve yourself and your selfish desires, or you'll serve God. You see, true worship is the true surrender of your spirit to him. It's that true bowing down. God, I recognize that you are holy. God, I recognize that you are worthy. You are mighty. You are awesome. It's that that true bowing down of your spirit. And last week, I closed with Hebrews 12, uh, 28. I want to look there again. Uh, Hebrews 12, verses 28 to 29. And I've got it on the screen, but I'm going to turn there anyway. Because it's good to look at. Just know that I'm not making this up. Hebrews verse, chapter 12, verses 28 to 29. It says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship, I put a little asterisk here, worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. You see, we are looking at these words and we see this word worship for again. And this time it's in Greek because the book of Hebrews was written in Greek. And the word there for worship was latreu. And I'm totally butchering that. And that essentially, and I don't know why that looks so weird. Um, that's impossible to read. <laughs> it got messed up when I downloaded it. It basically means to, I serve, especially God and put simply worship. Worship equals service equals worship equals service. I am serving specifically God. So when we read in Hebrews 12, 28, let us be thankful and so worship or serve God acceptably. And that's, that's where it's at. We are called, even designed to worship or to serve him as our God. And we always talk about how amazing it would be if the church would just come together and serve God. But that's exactly what we do when we come together and song on Sunday mornings. You ever notice how we call it a church service? Have you ever considered the fact that the service might not be for you, but it might actually be a service for God? 
Let me say that again. It might not be a service for you. It might be a service for God, right? We are quite literally serving God in a holy and acceptable way, right? We're coming together as the body of Christ and we're doing service for our King. It's not just about singing songs of God's praise. It's not just about soaking in his presence. Those are good things. Those are things we're doing, right? Like the priests, they invited the presence of the Lord and it was so heavy, the priests couldn't even go in, right? That's what we're striving for because we are serving our God in a holy and acceptable way. And when we serve him, when we praise him, when we worship him, we're inviting his presence in such a powerful and awesome way. See, when we come before him with praise and with songs and then with a worshipful heart, right? There's that delineation again. We come to him with praise and with songs, but we come with him with that worshipful heart. We're inviting him now to come into our midst. We're inviting him to come and be part of what we're doing. Just like the priests during the dedication of King Solomon, we are also called to be a royal priesthood, and we're coming together and doing a service for our king. We're honoring him during this time. And so I want to invite you to come even deeper in your time of praise and worship, not just here on Sunday mornings. Yes, it's important for us as the assembly, and I want to encourage you guys that this time, I said it last week, is arguably the most important time of the service, right? It's good to hear the message and it's good to draw closer to God, but it's also good to do a service to our God. But I mean it, it's more than just Sunday mornings. It's a day-to-day, hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute kind of thing, this idea of praise and worship. And I said I was going to close you, so I'm on my second closing. Pastor Mark always says you need three closings. I only got two today. Um, I'll close you a second time with this passage, and I've got it on the screen. It's Colossians 3, verses 23 to 24. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. There's that inward posturing again. Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And it's that same concept again. I can flip out serving for worship. I can flip out worship for serving. That's it. That's the beauty of it all. When we come together as the body on Sunday mornings and we praise God in an acceptable way, we're proclaiming outward. And when we worship, we're posturing inward. Amen? Well, Lord, we come before you humbly this morning. We are humbled by your grace. We are humbled by the magnitude of the beauty and the majesty of your great name. God, I pray that you'd continue to teach us to grow closer to you and to praise you in a more acceptable way and to worship you in a more acceptable way. God, that our worship would not be empty like the Pharisees, but our worship would be true in spirit. And Lord, we pray that you'd be glorified and that you would be the king over our lives, God. And I pray that you would come and be a part of not just our services, Lord, but come and be a part of our Mondays, our Tuesdays, our Wednesdays, God, as we serve you, as we fear you, as we worship you, as the great God who is the name above all names, the king above all kings, the Lord above all lords. We praise you in this place, God, and we worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. So as we get ready for communion, I'm going to ask the band uh, to come up. Um, As you guys know, we take communion every Sunday. And as we perform and play a little hymn for the Lord, I would encourage you guys to examine your heart. Um, It's very clear to take, you know, communion very seriously as the believer. And so as we sing this hymn to Jesus, I would encourage you guys to join us in that time of praise and worship. Bring your communion back to your seats and we'll take it together here in a few minutes. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are symbolically proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. And we know that through his death, our inheritance was purchased. Thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you 
for sending your son to die in our place that we might live, that we might be called your sons and daughters. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would live out your righteousness, Lord, that we would be the sweet aroma of your grace and your goodness. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, that's all I've got for you all today. I hope you guys are blessed. If not, Pastor will be back in a couple of weeks. File all your complaints with him. He'll be happy to hear them. <laughs> now, if you guys have any uh, questions, anything like that, come up. Uh, talk to me afterwards. I believe I'll also have the prayer team up as well. And we'll see you guys next week.